I think today uh, we're having a conversation. Um, I, I'm not the expert in, in living and dying um, because I haven't been there yet. Um, so uh, we have a conversation. If you want to come closer, please do. Um, uh, I'm, my name is Shen Wei. I am uh, the general manager for Kasi Hospice Foundation. Uh, Kasi Hospice Foundation, um, we are a hospice um, that the, what we do is provide end of life care, palliative care, hospice care for people experiencing uh, the end of life. Um, our patients specifically are stage four cancer and end stage kidney failure patients. And these patients come from different kind of backgrounds. They were referred to us from public and um, private hospitals. I, I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with palliative care or hospice care. Maybe I'll just take you through just very quickly. Um, so palliative care is part of the general medicine. Um, uh, it's a specialization uh, under general medicine. Um, the only big difference with medicine in general is that uh, if you go to a doctor, um, the aim is to cure. Cure your cold, cure your sore throat, cure your cancer, cure your um, headaches, cure um, stroke. Whereas palliative care is the subset of medicine that looks at uh, comfort. The main aim for palliative care is comfort. Comfort of the patient, comfort of the family. It only when the family is comforted can the patient be then experience more comfort. So uh, sometimes there is a very big distinction in medicine itself in doctors and nurses there and practices in how they view palliative care uh, because their training so far has always been to cure so sometimes it needs them to have a mindset shift to say hey maybe we can't cure now but we need to provide comfort yeah so palliative care is part still part of medicine and then hospice care is then a smaller subset of palliative care. Yeah. So palliative care you can receive at any point in time if you have been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Yeah. So for example, if you touch wood, um, get a blood test and you go to a doctor and the doctor tells you ah, stage two cancer, you can already start having receiving palliative care. Um, but hospice care is different. Uh, hospice care is when there's no longer uh, treatment possible. Yeah, so that's what we do at Kase Hospice. We provide this care for people who um, no longer can, uh, no longer has a cure. Yeah, um, the time frame that we are with them depends on the patient itself. Uh, sometimes it's two days, three days. Sometimes, sometimes it's uh, two years, three years, or even longer. So it depends very much on the patient itself and on on the illness itself. Um, the only thing that we don't do is provide them with a cure with what, um, what illness they have. La. When you are experiencing big illness, um, the trajectory is different. So we are somewhere in between uh, number two onwards. So you can be stable, you can be experiencing your cure, you can be go going through chemo, you're quite stable with the med medication, um, and sometimes can be unstable as well. Um, but our patients typically come to us around about stage two or sort of towards end of stage two. And then we accompany them um, all the way to stage four. And then we um, work with them, work with the family as well uh, throughout the stages and then provide bereavement services um, to the family. It's a roller coaster ride. So we ride with the patients and their family in terms of um, the care that we provide. Sometimes it's, it's really good. Sometimes the patient is really good, really okay. Sometimes they are not. So we need to ride with them. Our job is to ride with them in this roller coaster ride until the final day. And then we provide also services to their family. Uh, in Malaysia itself, uh, uh, about four out of 10 people re require palliative care. Uh, and this is 20, 20, 2019 survey that they did. Uh, but only one out of ten of this four out of ten, uh, four out of ten, um, are receiving any care, any palliative care or hospice care. So the number is very, very small. Yeah. So it's like 
a very, you need to go to somewhere. It's a crowded bus, but everyone needs to go into the bus, but the bus only has so much space. So there are a lot more work that we need to do uh, and the government need to do so that they understand this part so that uh, more people can experience palliative care uh, and hospice care and support them. Um, so at the moment in Malaysia, uh, hospice care typically are provided to patients or, or people who have an illness. Um, there are also people who are growing old but may not have an illness, but may require hospice care. But it's just that we don't have enough people in Malaysia to actually support that. Um, at, in, 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 at the moment, uh, Malaysia is also slightly behind, actually a bit behind, quite a lot behind Singapore, uh, in the sense that um, we are still very focused on cancer care, uh, kidney failure care, uh, stroke, um, but we're not so good at dementia care. Dementia patient also requires palliative care and hospice care, but we don't have uh, enough resources to do that. Um, we don't have enough people who know how to do that uh, in t at the moment in Malaysia. So there's, there's this. So Singapore did uh, a study uh, in terms of their, their population and who receives palliative care. So cancer patients only is one out of seven Singaporean who, who are receiving palliative and um, hospice care. In Malaysia, I'm not sure. I think Malaysia, um, our, our focus is still very much cancer uh, and, and slightly prominent terminal illness like heart attack, um, sometimes stroke, but still not the likes of dementia uh, and old age like I mentioned earlier. You know. So these are just uh, um, some figures about um, Kasi Hospice. So in the last five years, we have cared for about 5,000, more than 5,000 patients now. Um, so in Malaysia, the model of hospice in Malaysia is that we don't have a centre. Our centre is just an office, administrative office. Our doctors and nurses will go out to the patient's home or sometimes nursing home. Yes. We have arrived. Um, um, so, so the model in Malaysia, generally speaking, is that uh, our doctors and nurses will go to the patient's home or nursing home to visit them and to care for them. Singapore is slightly different. Uh, they sometimes, uh, so RCC hospice in Singapore is purely uh, inpatient. So you go to the hospital, uh, you go to hospice like going to a hospital. So they care for you in a building. Um, there are some hospices also kind of like us com doing community-based hospice service. Yeah. Our mileage is actually quite high um, because we have to go to the patient's home uh, to do the visit. And you would think that um, we only serve people who are maybe 60 and above, um, but there is actually 31% of our patients who are between ages of 18 and 60. Um, our youngest patient this year is 20. Our youngest patient last year was a two-month-old baby. Um, we also earlier this year we also had uh, two 13-year-old boys. Um, at the moment, I think we are also caring for one 15-year-old boy um, with cancer. Yeah. So our our um, our patients varies. Um, and their illnesses also varies, but we, for, ho for Kase Hospice, we only look after uh, cancer patients, stage four cancer patients and, and, and stage kidney failure. Other hospices may have different kind of, slightly different kind of focus. This is our coverage area for Kase Hospice. Um, so all the way from Rawang, Sungai Bulo, and then Shah Alam, PJ, uh, Kepong, Selayang, Jinjang, and Surinda. Yeah. Um, hospice Malaysia, there is about there are about six of us here in the Klang Valley area. So that you may have heard of Hospice Malaysia. They cover mainly the Cheras area and part of KL, uh, and so some part of um, PJ. Then there's SPEC, there is also FHL, uh, and then there are two other smaller ones. So we do, we try not to overlap so much. We operate individually, so there's no, uh, we are not reporting to each other. But we, but we work individually and cover our own area and our own patients. 
government organization. So um, the government d does give us some grant uh, based on our coverage and our uh, service, uh, but that come up to about less than 10% of our um, overall spending. Um, so we need to raise funds and thank you to BGF who will be helping us at our um, charity fair in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Any questions about hospice services? Death and dying. Uh, are we okay to talk about death and dying this morning? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can, you can say no, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, who is really prepared for it? I, I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Who is really prepared for it? I want to know, actually. Wow. Wow. How, how are you prepared? I have one of human beings. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the farewell parties. Wow. Okay. Very good. Yes. How, how are you preparing? Uh, well, I, uh, I regularly meditate. Uh -huh. uh, get into, try to get into a state of uh, like clear understanding, uh, mindfulness, uh, while trying to get into a concentrated kind of form. And hopefully, you know, with all the behind me, at least I can say I am preparing for it. You are prepared, okay. Yeah. Yep. Any else? Anybody else like to share? Yeah. Understanding the Buddha Dharma is that we actually uh, depend on the Buddha Dharma is uh, is what we are uh, practicing. Mm. So we should be aware of the three clearing, comfort, and uh, I think the last one I, I think it the palliative. Oh. I think when, when, we, when we understand about the Buddha Dharma, actually we don't die actually. So we understand that. <coughs> uh, because uh, more important is our heart. So uh, it's good uh, to understand the, the, uh, in the teaching is about the uh, physical part. Mm. But I think mentally the teaching of the Buddha helps us to cure everything. Mm. Cool. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else like to share if they are prepared or what they have thought about or what, are, what may be some of their worries? I, I think that is inevitable. It comes to all of us. There's no way you can escape it. Uh, of course, preparing for it is good. Uh, I, if I can ask a question about your, one of your slides, you mentioned mm. about four out of ten Malaysians need palliative care. Yes. Assuming the Malaysian population is 30 million, which means 12 million need palliative care. That's a huge number. Huge. Uh, 12 million mm. are on the... Oh my, I can't imagine that. That's uh, very, very high. 10 of us, 4 of us need palliative care. Yeah. Seriously? Actually, I would dispute that number a bit. Lah. I, I think at some point, we will all need palliative care, whether we have an illness or no illness. Um, at the end, I think, um, like I said earlier, um, what one of the research that Singapore is doing is into uh, people who are going growing older, but not necessarily having an illness. They are just growing older, right? How do we provide this kind of service to them? Currently, it is not available to them because palliative care. Maybe it's part because it's part of medicine. We still look at ah, what is your illness? Ah, okay, your stroke. Okay, can I can help you get comfort. But I look at you going, mm, you're just going about your daily life. Uh, you have no illness. Maybe, yeah, you can't hear, you're, like, you, you're now 75. You can't hear as per normal, as, as you know, as a younger generation, you can't see, but you are still walking around, you're still doing your usual normal um, activities. So do you need palliative care? At some stage you will, uh, but at the moment, um, it's not available. Yeah. yeah and, and if I can just add on. Sure. You mentioned about medicine is the cure. Yeah. I beg to defer because some chronic illnesses <coughs> are only managed. They are not cured. Mm. Because Western medicine do not actually cure the sim cure the illness, but sure. treats the symptoms. Yep. And uh, my next question is, 
in your palliative care as well as in a hospice care or whatever, do you have any cases of people on the verge of death and coming back to life, uh, you know? <laughs> that no need, I mean from hospice back to palliative and back to normal? Uh, we have a patient who, well, actually we have patients that we have discharged. Um, so they came to us because the prognosis from uh, the oncologist is that uh, six months or less, right? Um, but the symptoms are being managed. They manage themselves. Uh, we help them a little bit uh, in terms of medication. Um, and we have discharged them because they are so stable. We tell them, well, there, there's no point in us coming every week to see you or every other week to see you uh, because you're so stable. There's nothing that we can do um, to provide you more comfort, to manage more your symptoms. Everything is already there. Um, so we discharge them. So we will, but we'll tell them that anytime you experience a downturn, come back to us. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say go back, but they're, they're stable. Do you keep any statistics on that? Uh, in terms of how many of them we have. Uh, we have the numbers, but we haven't actually studied them. Mm. I don't think there are too many of them. There is probably, if I go back to my list, I can probably see three or four in the last, since 2005. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, how would Western medicine view those cases? How would Western medicine yeah. view? Would it be considered as spontaneous remission? Uh, I can't answer that question because I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not medically trained, so I can't answer that question. Um, I think it's, it's a combination of factor. Um, it is, it, because, mm, how should I answer this question politically correctly? Uh, I think everyone experiencing uh, the same illness, so for example, three, three breast cancer patients, same type of breast cancer, but they will experience different symptoms. Um, their condition will be different as well. So it's, although they may be taking the same chemo, um, they, uh, their experience will be different as well. So it's very hard f to say uh, this, this drug works for this, um, this illness. Um, so it's very difficult to say, to, to quantify that. Lah. Since you say that uh, when they have a fall, you know, they tend to be wrong. What is that? Because yesterday we had, I heard of a case, my friend's grandma, <laughs> She's a very talkative, she's very busy person. But once she falls already, now she's very withdrawn. So what shall we do as a caregiver? Um, mm, good question. Oh, good question, good question. Um, what shall you do as a caregiver? Um, I, I, hmm. Some people tend to do that. Um, sometimes, especially with age, um, when you have a big fall, and we, we hear that a few times, um, that you know, when people, when older generation have a fall, they never really recover. Um, so we've heard that as a common story. Um, what should you do? I think you should look at the person itself um, and provide that care according to the person. Sure, you should encourage them to, um, I think if, if there's broken bone or anything, they should see a doctor and they should do whatever it takes to, I feel, uh, to, to make sure that um, uh, it heals as much as possible. Um, sometimes it does take a big effort um, to actually move again. Um, if I can give an analog analogy, um, everybody remembers iPhone 3GS. Oh, some people shake that don't know what iPhone 3GS is. <laughs> first generation of cell phone, first generation of Apple, right? Can we use it today? Of course we can. Of course, uh, we can we charge it, can we? But how much do we need to charge it? Probably every half an hour. Yeah. Um, if there's an update of the phone, it makes it even slower. Sometimes it doesn't even update. Yeah. Sometimes if it falls on the floor or drop somewhere else, it will take longer time to come back on. So it's, it's just that, yeah. Um, just give it a bit of time uh, and a bit of 
love and care, slowly encourage them to come back. Um, I think that could possibly work. Yeah. The kind of work that you do, it's, it's really selfless. Uh, it's not the easiest thing uh, managing people um, at the last part of their life. I, I would just like to understand if it's okay to ask this question. Sure. Um, how do you do what you do in terms of setting yourself up mentally and spiritually? Because on a daily basis, you face people who you know um, would be at the last part of their life and journey. And the reason I'm asking this question is yep. I believe all of us in this room yep. do have family members yep. at one point in time will be in a similar situation that you see on a daily basis. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I must say I don't see them daily basis lah, because I sit in my office. Um, but my doctors and nurses, I've been out with them and I've seen how they work and I've seen the patient. Um, patient can be sitting like all of us here very well, very stable, but the next week or the week after, they may be totally different. Or, and I've seen patients, um, so I think it was about a month, so when I first started, maybe I tell you, when I first started, I was very much looking after. So the one thing that we do also is to loan out uh, free equipment, free hospital bed, free wheelchairs um, to patients, right? Um, so it was early when I first started this job that this patient came to us, I think it was on a Thursday, got referred to us on a Thursday. On Friday, the family came to pick up the hospital bed. On Monday, the, pick, the family returned the hospital bed. That affected me a lot because I never thought it would be that fast. It would be that quick, right? Um, then, as I grow into this job, I, I uh, went along with my nurses and doctors to have a home visit. Different conditions. Um, so, like I said, you know, some, some of them are like all of us here, sitting down, having a conversation um, while, while my nurses actually do all the vital signs, uh, checking with the patient how they are doing the past few weeks, uh, is anything to be concerned of. Um, but I've also been to homes where the husband is running around kind of like a headless chicken because the wife is in pain, in serious pain. Um, so my nurse quickly gave her a big injection. Um, the pain was nine. Half an hour later, the pain was still at seven. Yeah, that injection should have made her come down to maybe about five or six, but it hasn't. So we had to quickly um, call up hospital saline and say, hey, we have a patient where the pain is not managed. We need the hospital um, expertise in this. So then we arranged for the patient to be going back to hospital and for them to manage the patient on a longer term basis um, uh, so that their pain is being managed. Um, so how do I do this job? How do my nurses do this job? It's tough. Sometimes they would come back from uh, three visits and sit in my office say, I, I can't do this anymore because this patient like this, this patient like this, this patient like this. So I have that conversation with them. Sometimes it's not the patient. Because we also provide, because our focus is the patient's comfort, um, anything that's it's around the patient, not just the physical illness or physical um, symptoms that we need to manage, but it's also the family that we need to manage. When the family is panicking, it doesn't sit well with the patient. Yeah, Whether the patient is uh, semi-conscious or not conscious, um, whatever's happening around the patient is also important to us. So we also, our doctors and nurses also play a role as a bridge sometimes um, with uh, patient and their families or families and families. Um, typically, so it also varies between families. Uh, sometimes with bigger families, you have one sister with one idea, another brother with another idea, a third sister with a different idea, and that fourth sister, totally another different idea. Everybody is doing it for the good of the patient. But how do we manage what is best for the patient, when the, especially when the patient can't speak anymore? So um, our our job is also managing that situation. Yeah. Sometimes it's an elderly couple alone at home. The husband is caring for the wife 
and the children are either overseas working or um, on the daily basis out working, not at home. So how do we help them manage the situation? Um, I don't know if I answered your question. I, I, I don't know how my diligence nurses do it on a daily basis, um, but they have each other um, supporting each other, and I'm kind of also there, but in the office. Uh, how do I deal with spiritually? Yeah. I, I think what it, it, I think it's also what led, led me to this job. Um, what do I want to do? Um, what is my purpose? What is my purpose here? Um, I think what brought me to this job, um, I've done quite a few things um, in the past. Good things, huh? good things. Um, uh, I think what brought me to this was seeing how my dad went through cancer and <coughs> passing away, and then also my aunt passing away. Um, they both received palliative care and hospice care. So that kind of planted the seed for me. Um, so when this opportunity came up, I was like, okay, Maybe this is my time of giving back. So that was my purpose. So I think that was where I'm coming from. So when I see all of this um, situations and referrals, it's coming from what else can we do for them for whatever time remains. Yeah, I think half and half. Um, so for my doctors and nurses, uh, they all come into palliative without palliative training. So my, uh, my most senior doctor came to, came to us in 20, 2007, yeah. So she was a GP, um, so she needed a change from GP, so she came to us. And that's exactly when we needed a full-time doctor. Um, but she's not palliative trained. Um, she knows basics of medicine. Lah. But she's not palliative trained, so it took her a while to get on board, uh, on top of that. Um, then all my nurses also came through, either an ICU nurse or a, a triage nurse. So they understand medicine, but not necessarily palliative. Um, what motivates them? I think after a few years into the work, um, I feel, I think, la, I, I can't speak to them. I think what motivates them is that they are able to help someone and their family going through this very difficult journey, um, trying to figure out what is going to happen next. Um, so I think that's where they see the, their work is. Um, one of my nurses would, um, she would go, she would do the extra. So uh, a lot of, um, I'm not saying other, <coughs> I'm not saying other hospices are no good. I just think that we are better. Um, uh, what she would do is that she won't just go to see the patient. She won't just go to, okay, today, okay, your BP is okay, your heart rate is okay, uh, your oxygen level okay, uh, have you eaten a lot, okay, what's your... So she would do all of that, but she would also have a conversation with the patient and with the, um, with the family. If she sees that the family who is the caregiver sometimes Actually, most of the time, the sole caregiver is so tired. Um, and sometimes when you are the only one doing it every single day and you are of age, um, then there are certain things that you say, okay, I can't deal with it today. I have no other strength in me. Although physically, maybe I can, but I just can't manage that. So she would go in, simplest thing, wash their hair, give the patient a bath change the diaper. So these are things that my nurses and doctors would do. Yeah. So what motivates them? Maybe just that. That they are able to help in that small way. Making sure that everything is comfortable. Um, because like I said, you know, our work is comfort. Yeah. I, I guess depends. Depends on, on what they have been asked. Um, so if so spirituality, um, sometimes, um, especially if they ask, why, why am I going through this? Um, why do I have this sickness? Um, why are we like this, like this, like that? Why was my brother like this? Um, cannot understand the, the patient, right? Um, they will try to give them 
not, not so much wisdom, but the experience that they had. Um, if they need more guidance, religious guidance, <coughs> they may refer them to, then they will usually ask, do they belong to a church, do they belong to a temple, do they belong to an uh, association or mosque, can they seek help from there? If they can't, uh, then usually they can, but only like maybe a handful that you know maybe do not belong or um, have lost touch with um, the church or the temple or the mosque. Uh, then we may arrange, if we know someone who can actually attend to them, we may arrange that to happen. <clears throat> I remember there was one patient, um, <coughs> uh, she's Indian, but Mary a Chinese. So um, the family lived very Chinese lifestyle. Uh, there's the, the Chinese altar and all that stuff. Um, but she's Christian herself. She felt a bit uncomfortable in the son's home because she doesn't feel that she can do her Christian prayers in that home. So in that sense, we, um, one of our nurses actually contacted churches around her area and then to see if any volunteers can actually help take her to church once a week. Uh, no, we can't. We can't. Um, we only give medication when it's needed. Um, giving those opioids um, and painkillers to help um, patients get more comfort, um, it's very precise, if you like. It's, it's very precise. Um, there's a lot of calculation that is involved. Um, so we don't give, like, just because you ask. We would find out why do you need this? What is it for? Um, if, if, if there is a legitimate reason, um, sometimes maybe it's chest, um, very difficult to breathe, at night very difficult to sleep, then we may prescribe something for you to ease that so that you can breathe easier, you can sleep better at night. Um, but not so much um, when you ask, then we'll give. Yeah. If that answers your question. Yeah. Um, in the US, certain states would have, um, <coughs> it's legal to, for a person who is dying to refuse to eat and drink, it's legal. They can actually make that request. Uh, in New Zealand, um, you can actually request to have um, injectables. But to have that, you need to have prepared yourself to be there. You need to be in a condition uh, where you are definitely going there within the next six months to a year. And you need to have made that decision when you are still conscious when you are still in a sound mind and nobody is affecting your decision. So, it, yes, you can get that in New Zealand, uh, probably some other countries as well, but there are also levels of things that you need to complete um, before you can actually get there. It's not like, oh, today very painful, can I, can I, can I, I need the injection now. Um, you probably won't get it. You need to have made that decision maybe about at least six months before that. Yeah. And I will come back to, I, I like the way that you're asking that question because it kind of leads me to what I will want to talk about in a minute. Um, it's about planning. Um, for me, I find dying is the easy part. It's the easy part. Whatever happens after, it's also quite easy. It's when we have this terminal illness all the way to the dying point. What do we do in between? Of course, if we are healthy and bumping around like today, we can go anywhere, we can drive anywhere, it's okay. But what happens when we can't, when we can't walk anymore, when we are in a wheelchair or we are bedridden, we can't speak? I guess my question to all of you is, do you know what you want? Do you know what you want at, at that moment when you are, because this can be, when you, if you're bedridden and can't speak for yourself, it can be two days, it can be 24 hours, it can also be 10 years. 
Do you know what you want? Do you know what you want? Oh, still a lot don't know. Ma. <coughs> sure. Have you told anyone about that? Who have you told? Oh, good, good. Um, what did you write? Oh, a long list. Huh? A long list. Good. The more detail, the better. Yeah. It, may, it, could, it could come down to finer details like <clears throat> how, how, how do you want your hair to be like? Do you want it to be short, long, wash every day? What do you want your room to look like when you're being cared for and you can't speak for yourself? Um, like this, turn on the light, or do you want natural sunlight to come in? Do you want music? Who do you want to come visit you? Who do you want to know about your situation? And also on the other hand, who do you not want to come to visit you? <laughs> right? We all, in, the, in every family there's three or four like that. Nah. Yeah. So this is what we call advanced care planning. Really it's, it's a document that we document what we want from the time it doesn't have to be when you first start get diagnosed with terminal illness. It can start today, right? When this happens to me, I want this done. When this happens to me, I want this done, right? If I have a stroke tomorrow, um, what do I want done, right? So advanced care planning is all based on your own personal belief, your own personal um, preferences um, and goals, right? You can be the bedridden person, but every morning you still want to be in a wheelchair, wheeled out to the house, outside the house, get sunlight for half an hour. Right? You can still ask for that because that's your choice, that's your preference. Right? Why is it important? It's important because you, you don't want daughter A to say, no, this is not what Papa wants. Daughter B to say, no, exactly what she wants. And then, the third brother said, oh, yeah, you guys don't know anything, like, I'm the son, I will care for my dad. Right? Then it creates um, conflict, creates stress. Then everyone will be second guessing themselves, ah, but he said this then, but now he's like that, but is he meaning this side, this like this, or is he meaning other things? Right? Um, it, it reduces that, if you are prepared, it reduces that conflict and reduces that burden. Sometimes burden is not just monetary burden. Of course, we have to be practical. It's money is everything. Without money, a lot of things cannot do. Lah. Yeah. So, um, do you want a maid to care for you if your children are working? Right? If you don't have money, you can't hire a maid. Lah. So, um, <clears throat> you need to be prepared. And when can you... S who is it for? It's for everyone. Yeah. And when, is it, when can you start doing it? You can start doing it right today. Think about, you don't have to have everything written down because it's a long drawn process. You really need to think about what you want and your preferences before you can actually start writing it down, what you want done. <coughs> and the thing with this document is also that it changes. If you have written it down and you attend someone's um, funeral or wake, it might change you. If, um, if you attend another thing, it may change your perspective as well. Right? So it, this is a document that changes as you go along. But the key thing here is that you, you have it written down, not just written down, you have a discussion with people who are important to you. Um, we did this, um, at a, we did a couple of sessions with uh, smaller groups we uh, talked to them about ACP. And one of the questions that we, we, um, we presented to the group was, so if you are on life support, who is the person who is turning it off? One of the guys said, oh, of course my wife. La. I looked at him going, oh, okay, cool. But why is it of course? Why is it of course? Then he said, oh, because my wife. La. I was like, no, nothing wrong with that decision. But what if you, what if it's tomorrow? What if it's three years later? Your wife is, you, your parents are still here. Your siblings are still here. 
Have you actually, one, have you told your wife that she's doing that? Does she want to do that for you? What if, uh, have you told your parents that's what you wish? What if your wife is ready to turn it off, but your parents say no, we want to wait for another two more years and see what happens. There's this breakthrough medication. So what then? You can't speak, you're lying there. You're just there, you can hear everything, but you can't say what you want. Yeah, so there, in, I guess there's no, of course this would be like this. Um, unless you write it down, unless you tell the people who are important to you, who may be the one caring for you, um, or even the one closer to you, there's no, of course, this is going to be like this. Wow, very, suddenly very heavy. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> can we do a game? Can you take out your cell phone? Yeah. We, we, we'll see, we'll, we'll have a look at this game. Um, so, say you have, <coughs> you have an irre irreversible medical condition right now, right? Um, and you have six, six months to live. I'll give you a QR code later, you can scan. Um, so, if you can rate what is most important to you, yeah? Um, to be pain-free, uh, to, be, to reduce stress for my family, uh, to be cared for in a place that your choice, um, to receive all possible treatment, um, to say proper goodbye, to be surrounded by loved ones, to not be connected to machines, to, um, to not be on life support, um, or for your loved ones to know what your end life wishes are. Right? So you need to rate this nine um, out of what you feel the most. So once you've selected your first choice, then you can start going through your second choice, third choice, fourth choice, fifth choice, all the way to the ninth choice. So, so we've done this with three different groups. This, sorry, this is the third group. Um, there, there's no right or wrong choice here, uh, but I must say uh, the top two are very consistent. Um, Pain-free and being comfortable is priority. Uh, less stress and less burden on family is also right up there. Um, and then at the bottom, of course, la, receive all possible treatment and then not connected to machines. That's very consistent all across the three groups that we've tried this. You're done? Yeah. So, so you can see, you may not be choosing. Nobody knows your choice. Yeah. So, but this is the choice of the whole group when you're voting. This is the choice of the whole group. La. Um, so, that's why ACP um, advanced care planning is important because it's your choice, uh, it's not anybody else's choice. Yeah. If you don't say it now, you may not be able to say it later. Yeah. Yes? Can you read out Oh, sure, sure. Um, being pain-free and comfortable is top, top choice for most people here. So we have about 37 people doing this polling. Um, being pain-free and comfortable is top. Uh, on this, uh, closely followed by reduced stress and burden on family. And then to ensure my loved ones uh, know my end of life wishes is number three. Uh, number four is to not be on life support for a long time. Um, so it's slightly distinct to number eight, which is to not be connected to machines. So some of us 
would still like to be, okay, maybe I need the machine to help me, but I don't want the machine to be on for very long. If too long, then I don't want the machine anymore, just sh shut it down. Yeah? Uh, whereas some of you say, no one machines at all. Thank you. Yeah. Five. Yeah. Number five to be surrounded by loved ones. Uh, number seven to be cared for in a place of my choice. Yeah. Can you? Oh, is there still um, going at the back? Is there anything left? No. Ooh. Can you take two stickers and pass it around? Take two stickers and pass it around. Two stickers and pass it around. Yeah. Everybody got your piece of paper, right? So the question is, imagine if you have a, um, sorry, imagine if your loved one uh, was to sustain a very serious brain injury, either a stroke or road accident. What level of care would they like to have received? Number one, assume that they are in good health, there's no underlying medical condition. So you put your sticker on the scale, on the one end is all possible treatment, on the other end is comfort only. Right? Then number two, assume they have a permanent irreversible medical condition. Again, similarly on the scale, how would you decide for them? Two stickers. Yeah. Put on the scale. So the scale. Uh, Three boxes. Yeah. So the scale. Uh, on the one hand, on the far right hand corner, you have comfort. Uh, comfort measures only and reduce pain and discomfort. On the other end is all possible treatment. So for number one, assume. So you have already had the brain injury. Assume there's no medical condition, no other medical condition, very healthy. What kind of, where would you put, how would you decide for them? Then secondly, they have an irreversible medical condition. How would you decide for them? Uh, yes, as long as you know, you know which, which side you put. Yeah. Job scope of my horse. Uh, we, so our doctors and nurses will go to uh, our patient's home to care for them. So depending on what they need. Uh, so sometimes it's pain medication. Sometimes it's treating some other. Uh, so potentially they have cancer, but they may have contracted pneumonia. So we also need to treat that pneumonia so that they are comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, hospices in Malaysia um, are all community hospices, meaning that we go to, our doctors and nurses will go to the home of um, patients. There's only one hospice in Penang, Lotus, uh, that houses patients. Yeah. All other hospices are about 30, 30, no, wait, 30, pl 30 plus of us, our doctors and nurses will go to the home of the patient. I think depends, depends on the need of the patient, depends on what is happening um, at the household. Um, sometimes our nurses are in there for 45 minutes to one hour because it, the patient is quite stable. The family condition is very stable. Sometimes they can be in there for three hours. Hmm. So, so it depends on, on the condition of the patient one, condition of the surrounding. Yeah. Um, we have referred patients into nursing home uh, predominantly because they have uh, no other support. If they don't have any support, they can't stay at home by themselves or being cared for by also an elderly um, spouse, we generally would recommend that they go to nursing home. We don't force them to go to homes. If they want to go to homes, we will recommend which homes that they can possibly seek help from. We'll give them a list. We won't call these homes. We won't make the arrangements for them. They have to make the arrangements themselves. Um, so the other thing that our doctors and nurses do is also, at the end of life, there are different ways that you can go. Um, then the doctors and nurses will usually present them with all these different options. 
do you want to take this kind of drug so that you are more comfortable or this kind of drug that will maybe make you drowsy and not wake up or no drug at all. So um, this is already a very simplified formula. Um, they have longer discussion than that. So they will present all these different kind of forms, different kind of um, options to the family and to the patients and ask them to think about it and then let us know what they want. Then we can execute when we need to execute. So if you remember my first few slides, I said palliative, you can, you can receive it at any point in time when you have a terminal illness. Uh, whereas hospice, you are um, six months or less. So the hospice, the Lotus Hospice in Penang, their patients are generally the hospice kind, six months or less. Yeah. Some, hospices also, some hospices, because of space and resources, they only say three months or less. Whereas uh, PCU, palliative care units in hospitals, um, I can speak for Salang Hospital because uh, we know them a little bit better. So they set up uh, palliative care unit in Salang so that any patients that they've referred out that needs palliative care can go back to them immediately if something needs to be done. So they don't need to go through the normal emergency where they, can, they may have to wait for hours and hours. So they can, um, so the arrangement with different hospices with PCU Salang is that you just call PCU Salang and PCU Salang will, will make certain arrangement for the patients to come immediately to PCU um, so that they can get cared for immediately, no need to go to emergency and wait. Criteria to select patients. Uh, so, so for us, we, um, our system is that we only accept referrals from um, doctors, um, oncologists or, or um, kidney doctors, right? Um, so they, may, they must not have any more treatment um, because treatment doesn't really work anymore. So then they can come to us if they live around the air cover area that we do. Some days we will we'll get a uh, call say, hey, uh, we have a patient here, but they are in Sikampur. We, we don't cover Sikampur. Sometimes we'll get caught, uh, we're an Ipo, but I can't actually cover Ipo. Yeah. Ipo will have their own hospice. Right, coming back to homework. Um, if you can just look across to your neighbors, back, front, left, right, um, they may be different. How you choose for your loved ones. Uh, the rationale may be different from other people. Yeah. Anyone wants to share why they choose what they did? How they choose? Oh, this one. Yeah, oh, Husband and wife contra. Huh? So, oh, don't argue lah. Just, just nicely talk over a cup of tea. Uh, uh, or good food. Uh, have a discussion. Um, anyone at the extreme? I see there's there's two on one each each on one side. Why why is that? For case one, since the person is in good health and perhaps he just had an accident and then his brain is uh, in serious condition, if his brain can be uh, uh, can be can be can be recovered, then he he deserves to live a proper life because he's all in good health. Yep. I'm not talking about under uh, undergoing. Uh, I mean, good health under medical conditions, well controlled. I'm saying it's totally mm. perfect health, yep. no medication at all. So for that, I would say you should try to have all possible treatments to keep him alive. Yep. Because this uh, an accident yep. doesn't mean that it's end of him. Mm. Uh, let's not give up on him so early. Whereas if it's case number two and he has already got permanent, irreversible medical condition at that time and probably a, uh, quite a su significant period, then of course we try to give him the least, la, I mean, comfort measures only and reduce any pain and discomfort because even though how much you give to him, uh, he has got so many complications, morbidities that might not even help him in the long run and it's going to cause a lot more to the family and the caregivers. Sure. So, uh, that's why mine is on two extremes. Okay. Anyone with 
extremes, like both dots also on one side. No, uh, there, there's no right or wrong. La. There's no right or wrong. Yeah, it's what you think you would do. So, how easy was that task asking you to decide for someone? Easy, difficult, easy. If I ask you to decide for yourself, is it easy or difficult? Easy. Easier. Easy. Easier. Okay. Um, this question is um, coming back to your question earlier. I did this with my mum. First question she asked me, stroke ah? How serious ah? I was like, stroke lah. You just decide. You no, I can't decide. You need to tell me stroke, like right hand cannot use only, or half body cannot use, or sleep in the bed or any other variations. I said, no, you just answer the question. Stroke. No one answered my question because she needs to know ah, this situation must do this, this situation must do this, this situation must do this. Yeah. So I think it depends on the situation. Everybody is right, everybody is right. Um, it depends on the situation. Depends on what the doctor might tell you. Um, depend on the stroke, depend on the accident that has happened. Uh, what are the chances of recovery? So then you know what um, what to do next. Similarly with um, advanced care planning, there are a lot of knowledge that we need to get. Um, so for example, if I, I mean, you can say, ah, if I have a stroke, then do this for me. But your stroke could be very mild stroke. You just need physio, you can recover. Don't assume that stroke is always bedridden. So find out information about your condition or the conditions that you are particularly um, worried about, maybe because in the family history there are a lot of people like that. Yeah. So you may want to find out from that point of view first and say, okay, so in my family there are a lot of stomach cancer, right? So what are some symptoms, what are um, some care that for stomach cancer patients, what will stomach cancer patients look like when they start deteriorating? So then you are more well informed to make your decision in terms of what your care would be like. So, so I, again, it depends on the conversation that the surgeon or the doctor may have with you in terms of if can they get the blood clot out, how difficult it is to get the blood clot out, um, what other uh, side effects it may have to be, do they have to cut part of the brain off, if they have to cut part of the brain off, what part, what would it affect. So th things are, these are things that need to be considered also like, when you make that decision, um, either you know, for someone else for, or for yourself. So that's something that, um, that's what ACP is kind of about. You need to first identify your preferences, your beliefs, um, uh, and your life goals. What do you want? And then you look at um, uh, your, the different type of, we, we can't really go through every single medical condition. There's no way we can do that. Because medical condition today may be very different 10 years later and then 20 years later. We don't know that. But you, I think what we can do for now is to understand maybe the different types of um, medical condition that no family has had gone through. Then we can go from there. Yeah, or you are kind of experiencing that maybe you um, have a bypass. So you need to know, okay, if I have another heart attack, what would happen if I have a stroke? What do I want to, um, what do I want my care to be like? And then what do I want my medication to be like? Yeah. How do you motivate a, a person to actually uh, write down what they want for themselves? There's some old people are very taboo when you talk about that. It's, my mom is not taboo, um, but it's also hard to get her to write anything. Yeah. Um, there is a, um, I recently went to Singapore for a conference. Um, this lady was sharing that she is an advanced care planning facilitator. It took her three years to be talking to that with her mum, for her mum to finally say to her, oh, uh, so-and-so is uh, not very well. Can you do ACP for that person? So this is the first step of the mum accepting. So she is the facilitator. It took her conversation three years for the mum to first start to say, oh, okay, maybe ACP is useful. 
So, and then it, I think she also said it took another two years for the mom to actually finally sit down with her and go, okay, I'm kind of ready to start talking about what I want my care to be like, what I want my um, uh, future medication to be like. Uh, even then, it also took another year or so before they had a full conversation. Yeah. So it bit and pieces, uh, bit by bit. Um, perhaps the, the good way of starting that call, So what my mom did with my dad was that, so she would always talk about herself. I want this, I want this to be like this, want this to be like this, when I finally go. She doesn't invite my dad to respond, she just leave it there, waiting for him to come back to her and say, okay, I want the same, right? Or I don't want the same, yeah. So she has that kind of conversation. I think best advice is you give the person space um, to think, um, to consider, um, and have it there for them. We call it whole space. Have it there for them. Whenever they need to have that conversation with you, you are ready to have that conversation with them. Instead of, you ready now, they're not ready, you have that conversation with them. Then they're kind of like, don't, don't come to my house. You are that group that I don't want to see anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you, and we don't want to be in that group. Lah. Yeah, we are better than that. Yeah. With this, this Sometimes I think you can plan the hate. Example, yes. You talk to your loved one. Mm. In case something happens, do you want to be resuscitated? Mm. I think that helps a lot. It does. The decision yeah. Um, I can't. I, I, I don't have time to go through that. But uh, even when you say resuscitation, what do you mean? Yeah. Um, there are chest compressions. There are um, electric. Those electric shocks. Stung, um, then there's intubation. Um, there are a lot of things to do with resuscitation, uh, whether you want or not want. Yeah. Um, also, the doctors will advise you whether you uh, this person can have resuscitation, and if resuscitation, will they lead normal enough life after that? If they can't, doctors would usually say you decide. If they think that the patient can, after resuscitation, can go back to as normal as possible, they would generally do it. Um, if they don't think they can, if the, they don't think the patient can, they will usually refer back to the family members and say, do you want this to happen? And then they'll go through the process. Can, can we do this with the questionnaire by ourselves, or do we need a professional doctor or nurse or whoever to guide us through the process? Uh, there, are parts of the, there are parts of the form that you can do it on your own. Um, so for example, you write down what, how you want to be cared for. That's fine. Um, there is a part where you, you can write down the different kind of illnesses and then how you want to be cared for. That you may need um, a professional to have a conversation with um, to understand the illness and sometimes also what will happen if this happened. What will happen if you take these kind of medication? Uh, then different, different permutations, different, different uh, scenarios will come around. Um, I won't, like I said earlier, we can start doing it now, uh, and we should start doing it today, but the different illnesses around us is a lot. We cannot list everything down. And by the time we list everything down, 10 years later, it may change again. Yeah. So I would encourage you to look at what close to you, what, what, what's closer to you, like uh, if you have five family members who had experienced stroke uh, in their lifetime, then you may want to think about stroke first. If six of family members have cancer, then you may, a specific cancer, then you may want to look at that specific cancer first. Certainly, when it comes to treatment, then you need to have the conversation with the doctors, uh, and doctors will actually uh, not make that decision, but give you the option. But like I said earlier, you it could be you could be cured, you could not be cured, and then you need to be cared for. What it's that period of time for me? It's that period of time. That period could be twenty four hours to my passing. Um, that period could be ten years to my passing. What do you want to happen during that period of time? How do you want to be cared for? especially if you can't speak for yourself.
anymore. I remember my aunt, um, she has a lump here. Um, and I came back and I saw it because it was, it was quite protruding. So I said, do you want to get a doctor to look at it? And she was like, okay, 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 sure, sure. A year later, she still has that. She hasn't gone to the doctor. I said, a, a, a year already. Can you just go have a look at it? Her reply to me was, I, uh, if it bursts, I'll die. Gone already. Don't need doctor. Right? But I think that's something that we... That's the optimism in all of us. Uh, that we think, ah, if this happens, then we die already. Then, okay, finish. I don't need to know anymore. I have no will, no nothing, no nothing. It's not my problem anymore. I'm gone. But sometimes, maybe it's the pessimist side of me saying, ah, what if it bursts? and you don't die, then what? Uh, then what? So who is going to look after you? Where would you like to be looked after? Have you decided that? And we, we've seen that, our doctors and nurses have seen that in the families that they, uh, in the patients and the family that they've supported so far, um, that this one sibling wants to do this for the parents, this one sibling wants to do another different thing, then they don't communicate with each other, then they would communicate in individually with the doctor, say, hey, my mother wants this. Then this, two days later, this other sister will go, hey, my mother also wants this. Then the doctor will be like, huh? Your sister say this, you say this now. So sometimes our doctors and nurses will be, need to be that bridge now to have a family conference and say, okay, so let's everyone sit down and have a proper conversation about what's best. So how we see ACP is, um, there's me and mine. So me as in my values, my preferences, um, and then how I interact with my community, my surrounding, my environment. Um, sometimes it's not just siblings, sometimes it's pets. If I die, if I'm bedridden, who is going to look after my pets, right? Then my medical plan, my medical uh, care plan. Um, who is going to look after that? Can I decide for myself? What kind of care do I want? What kind of medication do I want? Right? Um, and then his death and funeral. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people kind of, kind of fall it up and say, oh, no, I die already, I don't care already. But you do care. You do care. Mm. We all care. I care. Yeah. So if we say we don't care, someone says they don't care, they actually do care. Yeah. Um, my colleague has a very very funny story. Um, this mother has planned everything because the children are overseas. So she's planned everything. She bought a Nirvana plot of land. She put it in her will that she has Nirvana land and she wants to be buried. So when she passed, the children came back. She didn't communicate with the children. The children came back, uh, passed away, do the ceremony, cremated, scattered in sea. <laughs> Two weeks later, they go to the lawyer's office. The lawyers open up the will and say, eh, Got a plot of land there. Eh? Oh, not used. Then the very next day, one of the sisters go, oh, yeah, last night I drove her mama. She said she's very cold. <laughs> so, so things like that happen, right? Um, things like that happen. So the, the point of ACP is not just for us to write, 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 write everything down, write everything down, but it's for us also to communicate that with whoever um, we think is important to us. Yeah. Yes, sir. Real, real story is that when we pass on, we are still around for the next three days. So the problem starts is when we, we are up there and we know our children is doing something that we don't want to do. So we can't get away. So we actually still around for three days. That's, that's my real story I came across. And the, the worst thing is we are not fulfilling our wishes. That's when you pass away, but when you're in on the bed, you're still kind of conscious, but you can't open your eyes. You hear everything. Yeah. Especially fighting for the, for the property. Oh, yeah, Lord. <laughs> I think this is kind of towards the end of my sharing. Now. I hope, I hope I've made sense. Yeah. I hope I add value. Now. I, I think everyone deals with it slightly differently. Um, I deal with it from a purpose point of view. This is, I feel this is my purpose. Um, whether I believe that this is coincident or not, it's a different story. I, I think um, 
for me coming to this job, l coming back from Singapore and landing in this job, Ming uh, Zhong I feel like yeah, it's 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 kind of pre-planned. Um, it's for me to. It's time for me to give back. So that's my purpose. So I, I for me, I think ACP kind of sits, kind of. So you have your will here. Anyone? Okay, I don't have a will yet, so I will write my will soon. Um, but we all have life insurances. We buy, my father would buy us life insurance from this company, this company, this company. So that's how he spends his money. Um, he also has a will, yeah. Um, then there's power attorney and then there's advanced care planning. So I think this all four sits nicely together supporting each other at different stages of your life. Yeah. Will, don't forget, will you only execute and when you don't read it um, when the person has already passed. Ah uh, yeah, yeah. So so no point. Uh, I mean, it's it's to me it's probably more like monetary stuff, asset stuff that you need to different you know d divide up. Whereas um, power of attorney is you can appoint someone to speak for you when decision is needed to be made, and you can't speak for yourself, and that only lasts when um, you are still alive. So if you can't sign documents anymore. You can have a power attorney, for, for example, you need to sign for her, she can't sign anymore, she gives you the power attorney. But it's, the power only lasts as long as she's alive. When she's gone, you cannot sign documents anymore on her behalf. Yeah. Then ACP is the pre-death, the pre -death, right up to death. In Malaysian law, you, um, ACP is still not recognised. Um, so you can have this plan, you can have conversation. That's why it's very important to have this conversation. That once you've written it down, it's very important to have this conversation with um, whoever's important to you, right? Um, because it's not recognized by law yet. Uh, different in Taiwan. Taiwan's recognized. It's a legal document. Um, doctors let them need to follow. Uh, Hong Kong, I think, also legal document. Singapore is working there. It's getting there. Yeah. So I think if you are the person, if you're the person going to that surgery, I, I'm just thinking about me lah. If I would, I would do it for myself. I would. Um, I think what I would say is, I would look at the condition. Certain conditions will have certain consequences, right? Um, like I said earlier, we can't know every single circumstances. It's it's very difficult. Five years down the road, I may be totally different, right? Um, I think what I would probably do is I would say, okay, if there is only, if I'm of this age, like if I'm 70, even a 50-50 surgery, don't need to do lah. If I can carry on after 70, if a 50-50 surgery I need to do, no need to do lah. Unless I have, unless it's, I, unless it's to help me to walk, right? Other stuff, okay lah. I've, I've lived to 70 already, right? So things like that lah. It, there's no way to write it very, 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 very clearly. Lah. It's, it's hard. Doctor, if it's like a coma, brain, maybe family, it's actually a doctor who is telling the family that, you know, you make a decision to take the heart out most of the time. Yeah. Because when you're up with, yeah, because if you're hooked up to the machine, every day the dollar actually clicks through. Correct. Yeah. Yes, you have said you don't want, to, uh, don't want to be resuscitated. The doctors will keep you comfortable. Sometimes the comfort also comes with um, painkillers injection. Yeah. So that is a, then another set of conversation. Do you want those painkilling um, injections? Again, will only is executed once you have passed away. So it doesn't really cover your care. Yeah. yeah. How about the power of attorney? Do you need professionals to do it? Yes. You need to go to court. A judge needs to say, yes, you have the power to sign on his behalf or her behalf. It's a legal document. Alright, so you only stamp it when it's a critical time? Uh, no, you have to have it done. Uh, there's, a sh there's a period that you need to get it done. When the person is of sound mind, the person cannot give you the power if the person cannot speak anymore. Yeah, but 
Yeah. Or the person can, if, if the person it has dementia, the person cannot give you the power. Exactly. Yeah. That's the that's a great part, lah. That's a really great part. Mm. I think uh, uh, through my one and a plus one plus year at Kasi Hospice, the one thing that I can see is um, still not a lot of focus is uh, caregivers, especially if they are primary caregiver for a patient. Um, sometimes their needs uh, are not looked after. Um, sometimes they are alone. They are very much alone. Um, People don't understand the struggle that they go through um, caring for someone who is sick. You, the person who is sick could still be managing themselves. For example, a dementia patient can still walk around, but caring for that dementia patient could be quite tough, especially if you're alone. Um, we don't have a support structure yet here in Malaysia um, to support caregivers like that. So that's why some of my nurses and, and doctors, lah, when they go to see patients, if they can see that the caregivers need a break, um, they will do what it takes to actually give them a break. Yeah. For example, it, really sometimes as a caregiver, you want to do a lot of things and you have to do a lot of things, especially if you're the only one. You have to clean the house, you have to cook, you have to um, make sure that the patient is clean, um, sometimes you just don't have that strength in you anymore. So you need someone to come and go and take, take over that. Even, you know, just change the diaper, even just wash the hair. Um, so sometimes things like that happen. Life never dies, although